Hello and welcome to another episode of TLC Unfiltered. My name is Emmanuel Sanubi. And my name is Ian Murphy. And today's episode is called, Who's Got Your Back? And our guest today is Mary Ma. Mary, welcome. Thank you so much. It's really good, good to be with you. And yeah. uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so my name is Mary. I have been in the corporate world far too long. Uh, about 38 years, my uh, working career. Doing what? Well... A mix. So I started off kind of quite humble. Um, and actually, it's part of the whole story. So I'll start there. I absolutely flunked my O levels at a time when, you know, trying to get your education going to set the path for your future was, you know, in the teenage years. Mm. Difficult time. So having failed magnificently, it was like, oh shit, what do we do with Mary? Pardon the language. Uh, so I went off to secretarial school and I got something under my belt for the future. And then I spent a good 10 years of my working life trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. Um, and being burnt from a certain failure at a certain age, I thought, I'm not going to do that again. And so I've always pushed and strived to increase my earning capacity, my involvement, my responsibility levels. And I took my career from being a receptionist secretary um, up into the marketing world. Um, and when I came back to the UK 20 years ago, I joined Oracle to start with. And um, it was just a, a happy landing into the corporate world of finding my feet and actually getting involved in business. And I really found my niche. I thought, right, I like this. Business, business is... Um, active and vibrant and it's important in the economy and you know you can make a difference and that's within marketing right yeah okay. back then I started in marketing thinking I don't really know how this works but we'll see I'll make it up as I go along that's what all marketing people do don't they nothing nothing's changed they all just make it up as yeah. they go along oh, I'm intrigued by the, um, <laughs> by, by the uh, get something under your belt was that something your parents convinced you oh, to do oh absolutely be, be, yeah. because when I, I failed my whole levels as well all levels by the way people are what you used to do at school to have a proper education rather than GCSEs I do anyway. GCSEs because I'm much <laughs> younger than both of these clearly <laughs> <laughs> um and, and I became a mechanic. I want my dream is to be a professional football, but I, I became a mechanic and my mum and dad convinced me to do it, to get a trade under your belt. you got a trade under your belt, yeah. kid, you'll never go far wrong. Exactly. I wanted to be an air hostess. I just wanted to travel the world. <laughs> I wasn't bothered about ambition or career. I just loved adventure and having fun. And I just thought being an air hostess was a simple, best way of getting a free air ticket anywhere I wanted to go. Um, but it wasn't to be. And then, of course, the parental responsibility kicked in and it was like, get something under your belt. So, yeah. you know, back then it was, well, you have to be a secretary because anybody needs a secretary. So that's how I started. And then when I got into marketing, I thought, oh, OK, this is interesting. This is where you can really actually make a difference to the sales environment. Um, and from there, I went through a various iterations of my career finding my feet um, and I found a niche in business operations marketing business operations um, very uh, excel spreadsheet driven and very analytical and it kind of appealed to my uh, left side of my brain very practical um, and I felt like okay this is this is quite fascinating but then Again, always striving, always trying, pushing myself. You know, I'm a little bit of a, an overachiever in that sense of the word. It was, well, how can I do more with this? And I then got into the cybersecurity world. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. This is actually an area where there's a real need. You know, there's a, there's a problem in the world. And the cybersecurity world is actually addressing that problem. It's still within marketing? Still within marketing. Right, okay. But it's like, okay, how do I get paid more? What, what do I need to do to push my career further? And my lying. goal, well, lying didn't really work, so I had to actually do some hard work. 
hard work in cyber security. That's mean you lied oh, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I just think, you know, it was part of my persona is how do I have more fun? Back to the I always, I always want to have a bit of fun. Well, you need good holidays to have fun. So how do you have good holidays? Well, you have to earn more money. How do you earn more money? Well, you need to climb up the career ladder a little bit further. So I just constantly pushed myself. It was like, right, well, I'm a marketing manager. Now I need to be a marketing director. How do I do that? And I was constantly learning and self-learning and driving and pushing um, and eventually I became the, the CMO the chief marketing officer in cybersecurity and I was like good I'm, I'm here I've done it and then there was a bit of a now what um, so that's a little background into my working career but along the way there have been pivotal moments in that path where I've had serious stress triggers that have been instrumental, I think, in accumulation that ultimately took me to complete and utter crash and burn. Yeah. And that's when I hit corporate burnout big time. Even going back, back a step, because it's weird that, because that's quite common that when people hit their goal, there is a question of what now? Mm. I've climbed the top of the mountain, yeah. I've seen the view, what do, I, yeah, yeah. what do I do now? Yeah. I think we, I think. As a human being, we strive, or, or should I say, we thrive on on the journey. Mm. And I mean, you'll you'll get there. You'll, I'm you'll hoping. Get there at I'm some hoping point. it won't yeah. be soon. No, it okay. won't. I mean, <sighs> <laughs> don't give up the dream. With, with you behind me, mate. <laughs> I might still one day be an air hostess. You yeah. never know. You can be the footballer. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm far too old for that. We've been talking about running earlier on and I just don't like it. Anyway, that's a different conversation altogether. So, so what does, what did corporate burnout look like to you and did you know it was that when it happened? No, it's hideous. It's, I, I don't, I couldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It's just literally hideous. It's the most, um, what's the right word? It, it creeps up unannounced, I think. And I think there are a lot of little signs and and symptoms along the way. Were these ones that you saw and thought, I need to keep going, or these ones that you missed? So that's I think that's really key because, you know, we live by fight or flight, right? Yeah. And stress is not necessarily a negative thing. It's the accumulation of stress or the accumulation of unmanaged stress. Yeah that gets to that burnout point. So I think if you are a person similar to me where you're very driven, you're very ambitious, you're very um, keen to make a mark and be completely contributing towards tangible results, these are all factors that drive you. And I think it's really important to be driven. Um, not everybody is, but we're all driven to a certain degree in our own personalities. And I think you need to really understand yourself and you have to really be honest with yourself about the difference between healthy drive and unhealthy stress. But, but that comes afterwards, doesn't it? That comes afterwards when you reflect on where you got to that point sure. of the oh, burnout. Yeah, yeah, sure. so, so you never do it during the time, and actually probably some of it is still part of that cognitive dissonance and things yeah. like that, that you you know you shouldn't be doing things, but you still do it because you're deriving some kind of pleasure out of it, yep. or, you, or it's feeding some kind of urge. So so where do you think those those urges and that drive came from for you? Was it something your family instilled? Was it something that you felt you had to do, maybe coming to the UK from a different uh, a different culture, or what, 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 what was that all about? What yeah. was, is it, was it fear of failure again? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I've always attributed a lot of my ambition to a fear of, of repeated failure. I never wanted to be in that situation again. Yeah. I mean, I literally remember going and getting my O-level results. <laughs> Summer holiday, everybody meets at the school, it's great, great reunion. I remember having an ice cream cone in my hand and getting my certificate and just my whole world just... How did you think you did? Because like if you, oh, if you I, failed I all it. of it, 
I thought I'd completely nailed it because my whole path had been easy. You know, I was I was bright. I, yeah. I performed well during school. In those days, you know, it was all streamed. I sat in the A yeah. stream. I just cruised along. But I had exam fear. F- uh, sorry, I had exam nerves. Yeah. That got the better of me, and I just drew blanks. Um, so the whole thing was like a massive shock to me, to the family. It I mean, was just a disaster. So many layers there. One, one of the ones actually, and we'll probably build on this throughout, but one of the ones there is a high achiever who coasts. Do you think in your work with executives and corporate burnout, is that a lot of that, is that how people get to burnout? Are they all high achievers who coast or...? No, I don't think, I, I don't think a high achiever will coast in a career. Right. I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite um, common in, in children because they need managing, they need parental yeah. guidance, teacher guidance. And I don't think I got that from my teaching uh, teachers. But I think once you're in the career as an adult, I think you've then learned a little bit more about yourself. And I think um, high achievers do tend to constantly push themselves. Mm. I don't think they're coasting. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. I don't think everybody who has corporate burnout, though, is a high achiever, yeah. just to put that out yeah. there. I think anybody can have corporate burnout. Mm. I've, I've, uh, the places where I've seen it more have been where people, it's just a job. It's not so much for them what, what they want to do, and that plays in them as well. Mm. So they're really chasing something that isn't really what they what they're passionate about yeah, yeah. and the pressure builds up yeah. and all of a sudden the pressure's too much and they snap yeah I, that's a very valid point I that's two valid points I've made you've, <laughs> you've done nothing I'm, I'm two nil down you've done nothing, done nothing. Done I think sense. that you can be so far outside of your comfort zone that that contributes to the stress and I think it's important that you find something in your career to do that you really enjoy doing and that plays to your strengths, that plays to your skill set um, and to your character. Yeah. And for me, I was in a very technical environment. And as many of the IT support team have told me, uh, you know, you get technophobes and then you get Mary, who's a technocripple. <laughs> <laughs> I love you know, I just, technology fascinates me and I love the fact that it's an enabler. Um, and it has phenomenal um, place in, in, you know, the economy and in our day-to-day lives. But it doesn't, you know, the, the bits and bytes and the actual coding underneath it all really doesn't interest me in the mm. slightest. So in that regard, I was kind of a marketeer in a very technical world, never really kind of loving the tech part of it. I loved the marketing part of it and I loved the results and the, the activities and the customer engagement and all of the things that come together with marketing. But the actual technology part, I didn't really. So I think you're quite right. It's that element of are you in something that really floats your boat or is it outside of your, your sort of comfort zone? I Googled you and according to Google, uh, Google says that you're a yoga teacher. Yeah. Is that right? I am. How did that... Well, I, I wasn't sure to believe it because Google also told me that you were born in 1824 in Portsmouth. I'm, I'm hanging out well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To your father, Daniel, and who's 44 at the time, and your mother, Sophia. Yeah, So that's I was like, well, me. one of these has got to be true at least. So <laughs> with, the, with the yoga, did that... Like the whole mindfulness of it, did that play a part into managing that kind of yeah. That burnout? Yeah, yeah. So, point number three, hundred <laughs> percent. Shall I go? Three nil. Just yeah. saying. Sure. Right, here we go, Istanbul. Three <laughs> nil down. Right, sorry, crack on. Yeah, you're you're hundred percent right. I had basically when I had corporate burnout, and and we can talk about you know what are some of the long term effects um, of it. I was so ill um, physically so so very ill I needed to find a way to get out of it and to become healthy again and I had 
well, we can get into it now. I, I have psoriatic arthritis, which is basically a combination of the skin condition of psoriasis and um, arthritis that is not osteo or rheumatoid, but is completely linked to the psoriasis. And the psoriasis is a, a skin condition that's an autoimmune that is aggravated by stress. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of a simple one and two, one and one equals two. You know, psoriasis plus arthritis equals an autoimmune debilitator. Um, and I'd got to the point where my joints were so badly inflamed, I was having steroid injections in my fingers, in my knees, in my hips. I was wearing a wrist splint. I was in a complete dark place, hiding under a blanket, booked off sick, really, really bad. And I thought, well, you know, this is just a vicious, deep, dark circle of anxiety, panic, stress, depression, illness. How do I come out of this? And I just started to go to the yoga studio or to the gym where they had yoga classes and just roll out my mat. And I couldn't actually do anything. I couldn't actually do yoga. But I just sat on it. And I just let them do the class. And I just sat there and sort of thought, well, maybe one day I can do some of this. And I, I went to stretch my joints because I felt like everything was locked. My whole body had just locked down. And I started just stretching. And slowly, it took me about two years, slowly I got to the point where I was able to do, well, quite fast actually, I got to the point where I was able to do the classes and then I realized that there was so much going on that had nothing to do with my physical body, but had so much to do with my mind. Yeah. Mindfulness and meditation and calming techniques and breathing techniques and things that actually were feeding my physical being, but starting in the mind. Um, and I got fascinated by that whole concept of how powerful the brain can be in terms of healing the physical body. Yeah. Um, and so I decided to do a yoga teacher training course to deepen my own knowledge. Um, and my, my whole aim and, and goal with it was to see how far I could go with my own yoga. <laughs> Overachiever again, you know, how much further <laughs> can I do this? Um, but equally well, and more importantly, how could I then pass that on to others? because it had been literally my lifesaver. Yeah. How could I then just give something back? And so I teach now, but I don't teach in gyms or in big classes. I teach one-on-one -on -one with people that mm. I feel mm. I could help. So, so the burnout bit was a gradual process which ended yeah. in the psoriatic arthritis yeah. and the pain and the constant pain. So it wasn't just one day you couldn't get out of bed. No. It was a slow, it crept up on you and it was slow. Yeah. And, then, and then from the a long rehabilitation period of over two years of kind of finding something that worked for you mm. and then that addiction then kicking back in yeah. that got you to that point again yeah. with you. So how does that addiction stay at bay now? I mean, using the word addiction... Oh, no, it's a good word. You know, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's appropriate. Um, how, how do you keep that at bay for something that you're so passionate in now from? Well, yoga kind of in itself, yeah. <laughs> in its own ethos has got nothing to do with ambitions and, and egos. Well, okay, that's a whole debatable subject. But um, in its true form, yoga is the antithesis of all of that. It's all about being true to yourself, being calm, being, um, being internally aware rather than being externally focused. So... Having a, um, a sense of priority about my own well-being maintains that calm balance of my personality and my, my desire for, for personal growth or mm. ambition. Can you imagine being too stressed out from yoga? No, absolutely not. Corporate burnout out from yoga. <laughs> no, but you know, there are people who get into yoga thinking <laughs> I need to be able to... Yeah, yeah do a handstand or, you know, wrap my legs around my neck or whatever it is. And that's where they're actually looking at yoga as an exercise form only. Yeah. And not really getting into the true philosophy of it all. So when we did um, Pilates at college, because I'm awesome, 
And it was much more about the breathing than anything else. 100%, yeah. Um, it's pronounced pelates. You sound stupid. <laughs> 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 pelates. <laughs> Sorry, when we're doing pelates. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way it's pelates. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine it is pilates, so we've all been saying it wrong. It could be pilates. Oh, I like that one, pilates. Actually, that sounds like a complaint, doesn't it? What's up, what's up with you? I've got I've to touch got it pilates. Pilates. <laughs> <laughs> that Sounds wrong. My pilates are playing that. We'll push them back in. I did it, I took it, I took it there. I know, I know, I knew, I, even, I knew it before. Right. I knew it before. I didn't. I didn't. No, you didn't. So. So t- talk us through how yoga plays a part in how you help executives and, and manage their stress and manage their busy lives. Well, I was going to ask is it just the executives or do you do it for teams of people as well? So oh, is anybody. It, so Absolutely is it, yeah, anybody. is it like helping exec... So I'm saying, isn't it just as important to help that exec understand the signs that he can recognise them or she can recognise them within their team? Mm. You have four, got four, <laughs> four, four nil. I thought you were going to have a point earlier on. Oh this. no, I think you had a point. Yeah, it was a good just, question. Just, it just I wasn't think you really just went point. in there and, and took the ball off him. Yeah, yeah. Which is why it's four nil. Yeah, yes, yes. I'm going in two footed next I re- time. I regret I nothing. <laughs> I can't remember the question. I'm going in two footed <laughs> and the elbows are up next time. <laughs> no, I think from a from a leadership point of view, there's an enormous responsibility on the health and well being of your teams, for sure. I'll put that out there. But I think that there are individual responsibilities as well. So it's a two-way street that, in fact, you could say it's a three-way because you've got the leader of the person, you've got the individual themselves, and then you should always have that neutral body, be that HR or colleagues or friends, etc. cetera. Um, so I think it's the responsibility of leadership to understand, and this is such an important topic that I really want to get into, is what can leaders do, or organizations, or even HR departments, if you want to, you know, hone it in there, what can they do for the health and well-being of their their organization? And one of my biggest realizations quite recently, a very good friend of mine I've been helping and working with um, through corporate burnout and the the lack of understanding from the organization about what's really going on with somebody who suffered burnout was diabolical where where an HR department has a mantra of you know oh it's well-being Friday so yeah. you know have the day off or it's um, here's a here's a handbook for the managers on how to look after their staff you know, these are tools, and these are certain um, They're tip offerings. boxes. They're, and a lot of tip boxes. It's, it's a way to say we're doing our part. Yep, yep. So I, it, that, it doesn't, it's never really seemed genuine. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's so, um, it's so, what's the word? When, when you're in a bad place and somebody just aggravates it further by their lack of understanding, it's so damaging, is yeah. the word. So if you're, if you're in a bad place and you're looking for help, you need somebody who really knows what they're talking about and who really has coming, coming at it, if prof, pre, preferably from a personal experience, but you can't have lots of HR people who've had their own personal corporate burnout. But if you've got somebody who really does understand what they're talking about and how to help these people, that makes a difference. What are the signs? So one of the first signs I would say is um, extreme levels of additional anxiety towards doing the job that they're already doing. So somebody who's extremely capable, highly experienced, very skilled in their, their area of expertise, suddenly doubting themselves, suddenly actually finding simple tasks overwhelming or things that they would normally have done in a short amount of time suddenly taking a lot longer. Mm. Additional extreme levels of anxiety. Um, I, I think that has to be balanced out as well because you hear a lot, uh, all, there always seems to be a new phrase or thing that comes up that people jump on and I see a lot of people have been talking for the past few years about imposter syndrome. Mm. So, so mm. I think when you talk about those heightened levels of anxiety, it's got to be from a baseline of 
you know, I think I'm in, inadequate most days, to be quite honest. He keeps reminding me of it, especially <laughs> being 4 0 down as well. But, but I don't think that's a bad thing, and I don't think that's a sign of anything else. I do think it's spotting the delta change in it yeah. and being able to spot the delta change yeah. in it, you know? Yeah. 4 1. Now, am I having that one? Yeah, 4 1. 4 1. That seems fair. Yeah, you're happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got. Um, Additional ways of spotting things, though, where people obviously start taking excessive amounts of time off. That, that's a very quick and obvious one. Um, also things where people, relationships within teams, people who suddenly start falling out with other people within their teams who maybe they've always just got along, they don't always have to be best friends, but colleagues who normally are able to um, work well suddenly don't. Um, I just think poor performance is a very delicate one to, to label as mm. such. It can be one, but um, I think you start to get into some deep water when you just talk about poor performance because there could be many other reasons mm. for poor performance other than corporate burnout. There could be personal issues, for example. So I think, you know, relationship deterioration, additional anxiety. The imposter syndrome, yes and no. I think you're right, definitely. Um, people have that fake it till you make it thing. Well, there's, a lot of it's going to be generational as well because you think there'll be our generation that was taught, get up and get over it. Yeah. Whereas you've got the younger generations that are taught a lot more about being more open with their issues. Mm. Whereas we didn't do that. Yeah. One just get on with it. Yeah. yeah. Car carry on. And I think that... that Five so. one. <laughs> I think you were the bar with that one. That was a solid... That was a solid goal. <laughs> that, that's not the stuff that happens, isn't it? So, you, so from someone from our, our generation, our age group, I can see that happening more because it is especially with responsibilities you might have and you take on more and more because that's what you've got to do. Well, you, 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 were, never, you were never taught to speak about it, you know. I, um, as a 17-year-old kid, I was involved in Hillsborough and I remember coming home from that day and my dad, my dad didn't speak to me. He went upstairs and my mum told me years afterwards he broke down in tears because he didn't know for five hours whether I was alive or not, right? There was no mobile phones back then. There was nothing. So you, it, even in your family, you weren't, you weren't. Exp it wasn't a thing you did in the eighties or, mm. or even the early nineties. It wasn't something you opened up about. No. Um, and and that just opened up at all. Didn't no, I, I, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. And and even then, even so, even now, it's still talking about. It, I still get emotional about it, right? But it, but for like twenty seven years. The, the, the pain of other people thinking you were to blame for that because of the cover-up and things like that um, has, has, a, has an effect on people. Mm. And, and I think when you talk about corporate burnout, it's almost the same. It's almost a corporate burnout where you are, you're, you're expected to behave in a certain way, so you keep that facade up. For sure. Until somebody at some point goes, are you okay? Yeah. But sincerely asks you if you if you're okay, exactly you know. Exactly right. And I exactly. think there's a difference with that, you know. Yeah, I think you know. There's there's we're on a learning curve here. You know, corporate burnout is now starting to be spoken about. Um, years back, it was it wasn't even known about, and prior to that, you just didn't talk about mm. things like that. So there there are decades of change, decades of learning, decades of different language, and I think. The older generation did just get on with it and certainly didn't talk about it. And then fast track forward to today and the younger generation who are talking about it a lot, but we, we, we have to bridge that gap between mm. the different generations, specifically, well, not just in the corporate world, everywhere, but bridging the conversation is, I think, the challenge that we're at now of two potentially completely different schools of thought yeah. where older generations maybe or even more conservative types or even perhaps just a C-suite mentality of get the business done, m meet the numbers, you know, get what the board is, is demanding. 
and the younger generation who perhaps are just doing their job yeah. want to get the paycheck and go and have a good time on the weekend, but actually are feeling a little bit under pressure. And then you've got somewhere in the middle people who are suffering serious burnout, but are maybe not able to completely articulate that well. Mm. So then they're either misunderstood as perhaps trying to get out of doing something or they're actually just not talking about it. So we need to we need to bridge this conversational gap with the right kind of language where we're on the one hand still motivating and driving and leading our teams to performance but equally well not ignoring people who are showing severe signs. Is it does it naturally follow, this may be a stupid question, it probably is, does it naturally follow that a toxic culture has more corporate burnout in it? I've got to say, actually, because I've just, I've just had a quick look on, uh, on Google, and something that's come from is burnout is about your workplace, not your people. Like, how much, how much truth do you mm-hmm. think there is about that? Because I, I kind of, I can, I can see that point. Mm. So I think as a... Everyone sort of answers up. So as a manager, I'm, I'm, I need you to get this job done. I'm, I'm very conscious that you've got stuff going on, but at the end of the day, I need to get you to do that job. You not doing that job is affecting me not doing my job, and that could then spiral. So mm. the stresses that's put on me, mm. I might put them now on you. Mm. Inversely, I might not be meaning to do it, but that's the kind of thing that's happened. So even if you now turn and say, look, I, I'm not okay. But that's one of the things that people don't do when they should do it. And I, I found great power in, in, in just saying when I'm not okay. Yeah. But I do that with a lot of emotions. If I, I will see other people doing better than me. And, but the moment I say I'm jealous, I feel better. Mm. And it just, just take ownership of that and deal with it rather than trying to push it under the, under the table and carry on. I think, yeah, I I pondered a little while about that toxic culture environment question because I think it's too easy to lay the blame on somebody else's door. Um, But actually, it's only within a safe environment that you can have the freedom to say, I'm not okay. Yeah. So in a way, I've kind of had my own little argument there, which is perhaps the culture is not supportive. And therefore, perhaps if the culture... Maybe I'm going to pull away a little bit from toxic because I think a toxic culture, you're going to have a mess, Mm. right? But you're going to have a mess in all kinds of ways. And I think you'll have a lot of corporate burnout, but you're probably going to have a whole lot of other stuff to deal with as well. Yeah, you'll have disengaged stuff as well. Exactly. You're going to have, you know, high turnover. You're going to have poor results. You just don't want toxicity at all. (laughs) But if you're in an environment that is either uneducated towards burnout or is um, in any other manner of means just not supportive of learning about modern issues, then you won't have an employee workforce that's, that's confident enough. And, and I, Do you have confidence when you're in burnout? No, you don't. So you have to be able to have others speak for you, probably. Yeah. Um, and you need someone to have your back, be that your colleague, your line manager, friends, family, whoever. So I, I've actually, I have a theory, and it's something that I, I use, I've explained it to people in the past. Um, I explained it a bit too well to someone actually, and they quit their job over it. Um, they, they, you know, it was, the next day they came and go, oh, I've handed you my notice. I was like, I didn't mean for you to do that. No. <laughs> Maybe that's what they had to do. Yeah, but that, and that's Can the you thing. Be booked for any kind of motivation. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is the thing. I, I, so I call this um, my triangle of happiness. And it's, so the, the concept is, if you take a circle and take a equilateral triangle of any size, that circle will fit perfectly within that triangle. Mm-hmm. So the way that I see it is that circle, that circle's you. And your triangle is made up of friends, family, and work. When those three are completely balanced, that circle fits exactly inside. And that's where I feel is my feeling of contentment. If one of those is slightly off, that circle doesn't fit. Sure. 
And it's very much about figuring out which one of the three is what you need to be, to work on because it might be family and then that will spill into your, your, your work mm -hmm. and it starts adding to that. It might spill over to your friends. And it is a question of which one do I need to change to get back to that equilibrium? Because, and sometimes that, I've had situations when the problem is family and that's a much harder thing to deal with, but you have to deal with it. I think if you don't, you're never gonna get that, that perfect shape where you can actually sit back and be happy. I really like that because quite often we talk about work-life balance yeah. and it's almost too simple of, as two sides of a scale that you've got your work and then life. Mm. And, and life is just like everything else. Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, I'm not going to go there. It's like I, corporate I, America I, I, and the rest of the world. I struggle with that as well because work is life, isn't it? It doesn't mean you, you, your work is your whole life, but it's a significant part yeah. of your life. So. It is, it is, but equally well, my, my point is work is this one component, but to your triangle, life is more than just one other point. Mm. Yeah. There is friends and family. Yeah. And I, I like the analogy because it's, I then look at the analogy of body, mind and soul yeah. as an individual. So in, in the external environment, you know, friends, family and work, I think is a very sensible triangle within to be You can a use it, just, just credit me for it, you can use it. Okay, maybe we'll, we, but we can't do the goal things anymore. No, I'm, then, I'm battered in the goal things. I'm gone. I'm defeated. Circles. <laughs> you have lost. You can do circles I'm, and triangles. To, to be quite honest, I've got a bit of a headache trying to work out what an equilateral triangle is. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a circle is. I was right? okay with the circle. <laughs> is that right? I've got it. Equilateral. There's more I, than one type of triangle. But then I actually thought you were drawing the Deathly Hallows. That's you know what, That's what it. So that symbol is what it reminds me of. That's why when I noticed it earlier on and I've been thinking about getting it because I've, I've got that on so many different places and it's the thing, especially when I'm just thinking about stuff, it's the diagram that I draw um, when I'm really just concentrating on just being. And, and the sword bit, is that you? No, it's, it's not, there is, that's the only part that's missing from the, from right. the Deathly Hallows. Okay. So, for copyright reasons. But I just, <laughs> For that, that the book out? Oh, it should come out. So, that, so that's what happened. So I explained that to a friend of mine that I used to work with, and he was like, that's actually really insightful. And I was like, I've helped someone. Then he came the next day and goes, I've quit. But, <laughs> oh. Whoops. <laughs> oh. Don't tell them why. Yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah, I think that, that that's one of my biggest messages is just about balance. And balance is not a two-way thing. It's, it's a balance of many... Balls spinning at the same time, many well, plates spinning. You think you even as a to, seesaw, it you, has three to, points. You've yeah. got the two ends, and then you've got you've the got middle. The pivot. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be able to look at yourself and go, "How are things in my world? Yeah. And what is my world? What does my world comprise of? What are the things that make me happy? What are the things that drive me? What are the things that I can do as an individual to enhance my overall health?" And we talk about physical health and everybody says, oh, you know, gosh, I've got a headache. Oh, yeah, have a paracetamol. You know, that'll, that'll sort it out. But I have a mental issue. Oh, you know, gosh. Well, you know, have a day off. I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure you're just a bit tired. People don't understand how to have a conversation about what's really going on. Why do you have a headache? Yeah. You know, you've been staring at your screen too long. This is one symptom of things that can build up, you know, computer generated um, focus or compute. What's the word? Um, too many hours spent at a computer. Yeah, screen time. Screen time. Thanks. It can be a multitude of, you know, headaches, neck pain, back pain, posture. You see people walking around, you know, with their heads at this angle all the time. What we need to do is just change our posture. There you go. So there's a counterbalance. So when, every, when something's off balance, the first thing we need to do is find out how to counterbalance before we can find the equilibrium. So if, if our diet is off, off piece, well, let's look at our food. If our friendships are out of whack, then let's have a conversation. If work has got you stressed, well, pull back a little bit, talk to somebody. All of these different things need to have a counterbalance. And so one of the things I would say is, Back to talk, mm. talk about it. I was going to say, 
um, and we all we all know what we should do, right? We all know we should uh, eat healthily, get exercise, go to bed early, and all that type of stuff. But we very rarely do it, mm. apart from this bloke here, who's <laughs> who's just exceptional. He's right. Yeah, I am. Um, so, so how how did it? How does somebody start? How does somebody get started in that? Because the words are easy to say, right, for, for a lot of people. What would be your advice for somebody who was thinking about that, has a lot of those pressures? Where do they start? And there is the bit that people struggle with so much because they set that expectation. I need to change, therefore I need to do that. Yeah. And they put the bar so far away that they can't, they're intimidated at the very offset and they can't get going. So, so my piece of advice is just start. Just, just, if you know you need to change one thing, start changing that one thing. If you know you need to change your diet, just start. It doesn't matter what you do. It's the act of starting. It doesn't matter that you're not going to, you know, whatever it is, eat carbs for a week or something. Just knowing in the morning that you're going to have a cup of herbal tea instead of high caffeinated coffee that's a starting point so just start with something start a conversation start going for a walk you know don't set that bar so high and go oh i'm going to enter a 5k run every weekend you know just start having a walk do something simple you get you get that within within fitness because i i do think that being f physically healthy again helps with your mental health. Hundred percent. Yeah. And it is if you if you eat crap, you're going to feel crap. Yep. Very very simple. Yep. And there was I was listening to this um, podcast the other day, and this is fitness instructor, and he was saying the biggest mistake a lot of people make is they go right, I'm gonna start this program, and then in three days time when they don't have abs yet, yeah. they're like this program isn't working. It's still working. Or they go right, I'm gonna throw out all of my junk food and then start eating apples and lettuce, and then in four days' time they're starving and they hate everything. And that's just, it's the same concept. It is the question of just starting. So you know you eat too much food. Yep. So let's just eat less food. Yeah. Just, sm just smallest small things like steps. that. I think, I, I can't remember the exact number, and I wish I did, but I think it's 21 days is the minimum amount of time to change a habit. So, you know, we say, oh, we're going to do something. It is, it is that. It I go 21 days time. to change a habit, um, 12 weeks to change your life. There you go. And you think about 12 weeks, you think, gosh, it's a long period of time. 12 weeks in, in, in your lifetime or in your yeah. year is such a small amount of time that can have such a radical change. So for me, when I was going through that absolute lowest of lows, I just went and sat on my yoga mat. And, you know, it took me two years to get to a point where I can now, you know, stand on my head and, and I'm happy and healthy and, and active again. But there were many, many p periods of success along those two years where things changed. Um, and so it's, it's doing something that is sustainable on a longer term for you is going to be a lot more successful than doing something that's completely foreign. Mm. You know, if you've never, if you don't like exercise, then find something that is giving you exercise on, you know, everybody knows this. Instead of going and trying to, you know, I don't know, play tennis, if you've never played tennis in your life, well, well go and dance, you know, do something that you do enjoy. Yeah. Um, and then maybe it's a bit more sustainable. So, so have you taken the yoga anywhere else? Because I I seen recently on holiday people doing yoga on stand up paddle boards. Yeah. Now I can is, basically stand up on a stand up paddle board, <laughs> let alone doing headstands on or anything like that. I was blown away by this stuff. Have you tried that? It, it, funny you should say that. Last month um, I took the whole month off and I went to Kenya um, because I need uh, I need sun and heat and I'm not very good in the winter and so I. Um, had this incredible month where I both basically had some fun, I had some holiday, I did some teaching of yoga into a, the same community that taught me, so I was able to give something back, I did some volunteering work, and, and one of the bits of fun was stand-up paddleboard yoga. Wow. Um, and I just thought, you're all having a bloody laugh. I mean, if I can stand up on this thing, that will be a result. Um, and we did an entire yoga class on the paddleboard. And I didn't fall off. Wow. So, 
yeah, it caused a lot of ripples, but there was a lot of shaking, but <laughs> it was incredibly good fun. Yeah, it was really good. So you can do things that you don't expect you can if you just give yourself the chance to fail. So pe- people will use the term mindfulness all the time, right? Yep. What does that mean? Oh, that's a great question. That's um, at least two. That's at least two. No, I, think you're, I think you're double points for that one. <laughs> Mindfulness is, if you break it down into the two parts of the word, it's being full of mind, right? So it's instead of, um, and I, I, I want to try and give credit to your question because it's such a, an important thing. So I'm thinking on my feet here. It's the ability to actually close down all your other senses and focus 100% just on something within you that you can focus on. So our brains are so active all the time, the number of thoughts we have per second is in, is in the tens of thousands. So in order to quieten our minds down, is very, very challenging, and a lot of people struggle with it. And that's why we, we quite often come back in yoga and in many other techniques to breathing. Because breathing is something we do automatically all day long and all night long. Um, but when you stop and actually count your breath or focus your brain and your mind on your breath, you can't think of anything else at that same moment in time. So mindfulness is the ability to focus on one thing at the expense of all else. Um, And in its very nature, it then impacts your central nervous system to the point of calming you physically. So there's so many incredible benefits from learning different breathing techniques. And there are so many techniques just about breathing. One of them, one of my favorites, and a lot of people use it, is called the square breathing technique, where you literally count, you know, for an inhalation, let's say for the for the number four. So you inhale for four, you then hold it for four, exhale for four, hold it for four. Um, And you can you can go in incremental numbers, you can start very low and keep it at low numbers. Depends where you're at. But the the very process of, e- of also visualizing that. If you close your eyes and visualize a square, it just brings you to a point of focus on yourself. And that, I think, is my mindfulness. So, so from a mindfulness point of view then, where do you stand on the use of technology with helping people to potentially achieve mindfulness or at least remind them that they may need to take some time out? I think it's great. Um, and I think it's back to my point earlier about technology being a really great enabler for a multitude of different things, not just in the corporate world, but in our personal lives. Um, you know, a lot of us wear smart gadgets now and have the ability um, to download or access different apps. And there are so many that are really useful. Um, Personally, I've used um, Headspace mm. uh, quite a lot. I know the Calm app is a very is another very good one. People with insomnia, um, there's a lot of different sleep apps. A hundred percent useful for sure, and I think it can it can actually double up, not just in in its application in itself and what it's doing, but also in reminders. You know, mm. you can set little alerts and reminders to yourself. Um, things that just say, walk away from your screen. You know, remember to stand up and take a break. Mm. Stretch you your body the Apple out. Watch, Apple Watch does that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So the, do you use the mindfulness app on this? I've, I've never used it on here, but obviously it pops up telling me to stand up. When, whenever it pops up, yeah. I, I now I'll go to use it. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's out of my control. It's random. So every, uh, literally maybe twice a day, it'll come up and it'll say, open the mindfulness app and literally, and it's just, you sit down and it just focus on your breathing. Yeah. And it's, because literally it's a minute out of my day yeah. that makes me feel a lot better. And that, that's the thing when it comes to how can technology help? Like, and I've always thought technology is technology. It's just mm. a tool. Mm. It's how you use the tool. So it's, for me, it's more people, how do people use technology to create a state of, better mindfulness 
yeah, you know, it's technology. Technology can either be helpful or what's the opposite? Unhelpful. <laughs> yeah, a, unhelpful. Hin a hindrance. Just, just edit all that. I think technology can be very useful if mm. you know what you want it to be used for. Yeah. Um, and you make sure that you use it for your purpose, not that it's driving you. Yeah. So using an app. Um, for mental health, I think is a really smart thing to do. Um, there are so many out there, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's really useful to just do a bit of research. If there's something specific that you want help with, be that breathing techniques, um, helping to sleep, um, helping to calm yourself in a certain situation, or even actually to stimulate you. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes corporate burnout or stress leads to severe depression and that well it, it always does severe depression is a very difficult thing to get out of and it is a medical condition so don't get me wrong you need medical treatment for that but an app can also participate in actually enabling you to deal with how to come out of something so if you're hyper lethargic for example or very um low in energy levels you know that app can say to you you know it's time to stand up it's time to actually move um, maybe do five minutes of exercise um, so using it almost in the opposite way as well you know both to calm you down but also to get you moving I, th I think there's there's the gamification in it as well isn't there mm -hmm. so on you know when you've got to close your three rings there you go see when you've got to close your three rings and things like that, and you've got to stand up, you and I never really fully understood the standing up bit, to mm -hmm. be quite honest. I, I, get, I get it more now. But actually then, pushing yourself on and setting different goals with the three rings, burning more calories, walking yep. further and things yep. like that. They're the little things, I think, that that people can start to use technology for to start promoting a better health. Do you know what? There's something, that, um, there's something that Apple do, which is actually really good. And it's... so. Because we've all got Apple Watches, I could, you can share your activity yeah. with other people, yeah. but I can also challenge you. Yeah. So I did this with a friend of mine. Yeah, I've done it as well. And, like, and it's like seven day period, but it's not about who can get the most calories because it maxes out. It maxes out at 600, it gives you a point for every one, uh, every percent of your ring that you close up to 600 points right so you actually can't win yeah you can draw yeah. or you can lose but you can't win but we're so me and when i did it with a friend of mine we're so sort of competitive with each other wow. is that we're we're fighting for a draw yeah and it's just a, it's just so lit and all i was doing each day was making sure that i completed it as early as i could so i had the rest of the day just to be yeah and it, it's, when I do that, it's the most functional week I ever have. There, I, I just want to pick up on that because that's another really key point. Is if you can do something earlier yeah. in the day, it sets you up. So if if you if you don't love doing exercise, get it over and done with. Yeah. You know, get something out the way. If you're not very experienced in breathing techniques, for example, start your day with them. It's it's always like that to do list. What do you think? Kick off a couple yeah. of simple things I, and I, then get into something to, you don't enjoy. When doing. I started training, and it was when, when it was when my son was born. I was like, I'm going to finish work and then go straight to the gym. And going to the gym after a day's work, mm. I it's I don't want to do that. No, I, I'm not in the mood really for hard. this. Mm. So I started to go. I'd I'd get up at six because I'd be up at that time anyway for him, and then I'd be in the gym half six to half seven. And what I found was, by the time I've got to work now and everyone else is still waking up, I'm already alert because I've done three things before exactly. I've got here. Yeah, it's very and, and that now, mm. I, I have to train first thing. Before I do anything, I have to get that out of the way mm. and then it's, it's done. Mm. And it's much easier. Like I, I've said today, I, I, I lied to myself. I was going to get up early this morning to go to the gym before we had to come to do this. I was like, do you know what? We'll finish, it. We'll finish about three. I'll go afterwards. <laughs> There's not a chance in hell I'm going when I get home. Cheat day. Yeah, cheat, cheat day now. Cheat I'm day. going home for a bowl of cereal. And then I might, I, I will probably go for a walk because I like to move, but I'm not going to go and do the 10K run that I was planning on doing because I've, I've left it too late now. And 
You shouldn't run anyway. It's bad on your junk. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also quite an interesting point is how hard are you on yourself? Mm. Yeah. And I think for people who are both very competitive and also high achievers, you can be so hard on yourself and it's learning about having a little self-compassion to yeah. actually say, mm. do you know yeah. what? I didn't, it doesn't matter. I didn't run today first mm. thing. It's okay. Rest I'll is just as important. Rest is really important. But equally, I'm not going to beat myself up about it because yeah. it doesn't that, really that matter. That changes though when there's expectations on you. So I watched the Gaza documentary, right? And you can't fail but love that guy, right? You cannot fail... But he was so failed throughout his career by the people around him. Mm. And the expectation that they put him, it, it's, it's no wonder the guy mm. is, Ooh, is the referee. A lot of people say yeah. the same thing was with, um, you look at Robbie Williams' life when yeah. he speaks about it. Yeah. And, and yeah. like, they, they were kids. Yeah. He was not the youngest one. Yeah. And they were kids being put into that. And he was like saying, I didn't know what to do. So yeah. I would just go to the hotel room with a bottle of vodka and drink the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, the gymnast, um, what's her name, Simone? Oh, the, the American girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. where oh, she was yes, like, I'm not yes. doing this anymore. Yeah. And people had a go at her, and yeah. it's like, that is a lot of pressure, like to be, imagine you're the most decorated gymnast, decorated athlete mm. in history. Mm. That's going to take its time. Mm. Well, it's back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, reaching a certain goal in your career, like, and now what? The expectation on you is to maintain that yeah. and to still keep somehow growing. Yeah. So how do you grow within an environment where you're already at the top of your game? You need to find other stimulation and other mm. sources of personal satisfaction and growth. Yeah. But, but that comes back exactly to your point about the triangle and, and the circle. Yeah. You know, you can work on the circle inside to improve yourself, but actually the external things that yeah. you potentially have no influence over whatsoever. The external factors are key. Yeah. And back to your point about, about toxic uh, environments and toxicity in a corporate environment, you do need to watch where you put yourself. Yeah. And there's an onus of responsibility that is bi-directional. So I need to make sure that I put myself in good environments, but equally well, those environments need to treat me with respect. Mm. So if you're in a bad environment, first find out if they can change it for you. Mm -hmm. If not, get out. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same. I think it's all relationships. You can have good and... If you, if what you, and I don't believe so much in good and bad relationships, but if what you're getting out of that relationship is mostly negative, yep. then change that relationship. Yep, correct. You, you have to. Uh, some, sometimes you have to be responsible. I, I've always, I've said this to many people. Nobody is going to care as much about you than you. Exactly, and you have to take ownership. And I think that ultimately would be my final kind of comment is you need to take accountability for yourself. Mm. And if you are not able to, for a certain reason, either you haven't got the maturity level, you don't have the experience, you don't have the awareness, or you simply are in such a dark place, you need to make sure that you've got somebody who's got your back, mm. who could do that for you, or can at least prompt you to yeah. do something for yourself. And then you, know you need to actually start going, what am I going to do for myself? Because that's the thing, some people might not see it, so at that time, I mean, I've always said I've been very fortunate that I've got a amazing circle of friends around me mm. that will pick up on there's something not right with them yeah. and ask me that question. I read something the other day about a WhatsApp group of friends where they have a check-in moment in time that each one of them has to say how I am really feeling mm -hmm. instead of just going, hey, how are you? How are you really feeling? Mm. That was one. And the other thing we used to do at work um, in our teams was we used to do a scoring system. Because sometimes people don't really want to talk about their feelings. You know, mm. if I say, how are you really feeling? You're a bit like, oh, it's quite deep, you know, before I've had coffee in the yeah, morning. Yeah. So maybe you actually go, okay, uh, it's nine o'clock in the morning. We're having a team meeting. Hi, Ian. On a scale of one to 10, where are you at? And then you can go, God, you know, right now I feel probably about a six. You're like, mm, okay, do you want to go into that? Should we talk about it now or mm. later? Or somebody else can go, oh, I'm a nine. And it sort of just gives you as a leader the ability to know you're dealing with six or eight people or four, whatever, in the room who are mm. at different levels but, right but then that, and then. 
that, that circle of friends, I, that, like you, I, I do have friends, believe it or not. But I, <laughs> I do. Um, they really ground you. Mm. They stop you from going places where you think you are in maybe a, in a corporate world to somebody else. And, and, you know, on the WhatsApp group that I have with, with my friends as well, it doesn't matter what you're doing or where you are or how good you think you are. They will bring you down to earth, not to keep you down to earth, mm. but that that for me, that for me is a happy place. You know that that is where you can be yourself with your friends. Whereas sometimes in organisations, you you have to keep you have to keep up a facade sometimes. Yeah. You know, and I think on on I, I, I think on that point and ownership, I think it's a great place to to pause this discussion. Um, but. I'd love to continue it again. I'd love to do a second part of this, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm saying. You know, this is so interesting. It's so enthralling. It's actually got us leaning in to yeah. <laughs> to, to find out more. You know, we'd love to. We'd love to do. This a second is the part of least this. we've ever ha- made any inappropriate jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very like serious ever. subject. It's really. Uh, but we normally take really... serious subjects and we will run with it. But yeah. with this one, I'm like realizing now that how how engaging it can be and how helpful it can be as well. Oh, thank you. It's been really good to chat. It's, it's been fantastic, Mary. Thanks for coming along. We've You're really so enjoyed welcome. it. welcome. Hey, and I look forward to giving you a bit of a yoga class. Maybe next time we could actually get on the mat. Absolutely. That would be quite fun, actually, Absolutely. doing this whole fun. thing again, but on, on yoga mats. Yeah, we can, we can do a bit of movement and, and talk and sit and chat on, I, on I the mat. I don't have to wear Lycra, though. Do I'm no, 100% please don't wear, wear, please I'm wearing don't wear Lycra. <laughs> I'm 100% wearing Lycra. You're wearing Lycra now? Yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> no, is happening. You wear what you feel comfortable in. <laughs> you shouldn't say that to I know, I shouldn't have said that <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it came out. I'm, I'm really yeah. comfortable in Lycra. <laughs> I'll take like eight, 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 e